Darren, you dropped such big hints that you wanted someone to ask you a question about um, maximum fines. So yeah. I think I just have to get it over and done with, otherwise you're going to shoehorn it into some other oh, question. So um, you have about four seconds to answer this, um, okay. um, which should at least limit you to a minute. The, um, tell us a little bit about the fines and tell us about the reality of what we can expect the, there. The reality is that 20, euro, 20 million euro fines for organisations is nonsense. Um, the Information Commissioner is, is describing the concept of scaling up existing fines, so the existing maximum is 500k, um, the, the most that's ever been, uh, someone's ever been fined is 400k. Scaling up um, according to the new maximums under GDPR is, is nonsense. Fines need to be um, effective, proportionate and dissuasive. Dissuasive basically means they need to make sure that you don't do it again and you need that it, because they're made public they need to be big enough to make sure that others who might be tempted to do what you've done don't do it again but the proportionate bit means that the ICO does look at all of the circumstances does look at your means does look at the size of the organization and um, GDPR is pretty clear as well in in setting out the things that the information commissioner will take into account so They'll look, at the, the, they'll look at how negligent you were, basically. Was this a breach that you could have done something about? Have you, on the security front, complied with the basics around cyber essentials, which is the government standard? Um, you know, they'll, look at, they'll look at how they found out about the breach. Did you tell them, or did it come to their attention because there was a complaint that, by, by a data subject that, they're in, that their personal data was all over the internet? So, Fines, um, 20 million euros, forget about it. Um, what, 30 seconds more though, Jonathan, if I may. Fines aren't the only thing that um, businesses need to be thinking about. Before the ICO gets to fines, they have powers to um, effectively demand legally that you provide them with information. They have the powers to demand that they come into your business and do an assessment. Um, they will, they can, give you what are called enforcement notices that you have to do certain things otherwise it's a criminal offence and, and leaving aside the ICO the reputational, da reputational damage is going to be massive in the new world because um, there is a greater focus now on, on privacy and uh, personal data compliance and enforcement notices as well as fines are going to be plastered all over the ICO's website the ICO will make it public if you've been told that um, by, by the ICO, look, we need to come in and we're going to assess you, you and you have to comply. That will be on the ICO's website. So rep reputational damage is going to be the, pretty much the new currency. People ought to be really worried about reputational worried, uh, da uh, damage. Fines are real, but they're going to be proportionate. Um, and you're talking probably tens of thousands in most cases, not hundreds of thousands or millions. That, folks, is why we generally sell most of our advice not on a time basis because, just to clarify, that was a good four seconds worth and <laughs> generally we like to fix price on that basis. Go on. My understanding also is that they are funded by fines, so they are hungry for fining. No, oh, it's, it's yeah. not actually. Yeah. Is that actually yeah. No, it's not correct. The, the fi fines go in, sorry Jason, sorry, yeah. fi fines go into the, um, the UK central government pot. They're, they're going to be funded by the fees uh, that okay. they get, but not by the fines. They've specifically said we don't want to be funded by the fines because it creates a conflict of interest. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. So if from the ICO to date have been very hands-off with fines, so they've, uh, other than really major breaches, um, and that's, that's where I'm from, the NHS, so there have been major breaches <laughs> in the NHS, but other than really major ones, they haven't done much. Is, are they anticipating a bit of a change of attitude that they will be crunching down on smaller breaches now? Um, you, first of all, you're right. In 2016, there were 21 fines, aggregate 2 million quid. So there were 21 fines, not that many. Um, do I anticipate that the number of fines will go up? Yes. Do I anticipate that the number of fines will go up hugely? No, um, because the inf what, what isn't... Um, publicised greatly is all of these other mechanisms that the ICO have got. They can come in and force you to allow them to assess, you know, the, the ICO can force you to uh, be assessed. They can 
give you um, what are called enforcement notices, and if you don't comply with those enforcement notices, there are serious sanctions. So, it, so f fines for them are going to be the end of the road yeah, of a are, number of stages. Fines are the end of the okay. road of a number of stages. Uh, let's just move it on from from that air, if we can. The um, but thanks. Uh, the other question. I want to get onto the question of consent in a minute because we heard different things. We heard quite a lot about consent from you guys as a practical point of view. We heard you talking about consent as a dead dog. So I want to know how much life there is in that dog in a minute. Well, so but are there other questions folks want to throw out in the meantime? Got one up at the back there. Do you know that's really fantastic? <laughs> I appreciate that. I just want to clarify that that was not loaded, but. <laughs> Okay, who, who'd like to pick that up? I think I suspect it's going to be one of you two guys. Um, Definitely not me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can talk with that consent generally. Um, from an internal perspective, and Darren mentioned it briefly, external, internal, and we've both mentioned it. Yeah, so when you um, mean external, internal, you mean either your own workforce yeah. or you mean your clients and your suppliers. Yeah, so external yeah. is client suppliers, people outside your organisation, internal is the people within your own workforce. Um, if you're dealing with, if you're processing data from people outside, that means you're taking the data and then doing something with it, then you should have their consent. Now the difficulty with that circumstance is whether the individual is doing that on their own back or whether you as an organisation were processing or allowing the individual to do it. I know that Darren will speak more about that. Um, from an internal perspective, getting consent from individuals, that's driven by your privacy notices. As Darren's already mentioned, the power balance is such that an employer can't rely on consent from employees so you use privacy notices um, effectively to, to manage how you handle the data. So you let people know this is the data we're collecting, this is why we're collecting it, and this is what we're doing with it. Um, and that's your internal perspective. I think yours was more about taking the data from external. I don't know what context so you're doing it. Internally. So the, 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 it comes up all the time that an employee has done something in their personal Yeah. And that's probably not okay. Yeah. No, no, it is okay. Maybe this is such a, it is a great point, and it's such an important point that if Jonathan will permit me, I'm going to take two minutes to explain it properly. Because actually, for <laughs> employers, <laughs> for employers, this is the thing that you need to know. You've got a bundle in front of you. Have a look at pages six and seven. Okay. I mentioned when I was talking processing conditions, um, non-legal language roughly translated, processing conditions are the valid legal reasons for processing data. So on page six, you've got the six processing conditions for personal data that isn't sensitive. There's a typo there actually on page six. It says personal data that is special category. It should say it's not special category. And then on page seven, when you're talking about sensitive personal data, you've got the processing conditions for that. Now. In the employment context, have a look on page six at B. Processing is necessary for the performance of a contract to which the data party is a subject. Forgetting about consent, you're going to be able to process a lot of personal data under that. But on your, the answer to your question is actually you don't need consent because the processing condition that is relevant is little f there, which is in the legitimate interests of the controller balancing up the rights of the data subject. Now, what you need to do when relying on that processing condition and monitoring subject, uh, monitoring email usage, um, internet usage, social media, can come squarely within that processing condition because what's a legitimate interest? Well, basically anything that's lawful that an employer might want to do. But then what you have to do is consciously and preferably in writing um, by reference to your auditing, to your auditing uh, framework, balance up your legitimate interests with the rights and freedoms of the data controller. And as long as you go through that balancing process and decide a actually that 
our interests outweigh their interests because do you know what? We've been very clear in our privacy notices that this is what we're going to do. No problem. That's fantastic. So that actually creates opportunity in a way. So if you took another example of that, um, the, you know, you have a problem of theft from a vending machine, so you set the camera up temporarily, okay. it catches someone um, doing the old whack on the machine and nicking yeah. stuff, uh, they then say, you, you can't no, use no, that, no. I never consented to the camera. Yeah. So how would that work? Well, same principle really. Your, your starting point is forget about consent because it's irrelevant now in employment. There, there are some exceptions, but it's, it's basically irrelevant. So your starting point would be that six little f, legitimate interest balance up with interests and rights. That balancing exercise, particularly in areas of any kind of monitoring, is gonna require what's gonna be known in the new world as a data protection impact assessment, what's presently known in the existing world as a privacy impact assessment, which is where you consciously, and ideally in writing, write down um, your interests, how you're going to balance those interests with the data subject and, and reach a conclusion. Now, the point about this uh, GDPR is it, it requires c transparency. So as long as you're being transparent and you actually undertake that balancing exercise and you tell them what it is you're, you're proposing to do, most of the time you're going to be broadly okay. The key is moving from thinking about consent which is illusory, really, um, to um, thinking about this balancing exercise and being clear about your thinking. And I think to expand on that, in, in Jonathan's scenario, if you set up a TV because someone was stealing from the vending machine, then effectively when you were doing that or considering that decision, that's when your data impact assessment comes in to say, we're going to put this TV up, what are the data subjects right, what are we likely to do, and therefore we've made a conclusion that it's in our legitimate interest to do this. Um, and that's what you're documenting, and that's what the process is. And, and just one more point that will feed into every single other question that we, that we get asked. That's exactly why you need to keep separate in your thinking how these principles and, and processing conditions apply in the commercial world and in the employment world, because actually these things can apply to virtually an infinite variety of situations. Mm -hmm.